How is pizza like sex? Well, when it's good, it is great. And when it's bad, it's still pretty darn good. (laughs) Today, I am thrilled to share with you a crowd favorite of our whole food plant-based line of products, and that's our Plant Strong Pizza Crust Kit that is great. Our kit is made from organic whole grains with no added oil, very little salt, and a kiss of maple syrup. It's incredibly easy to use. Each kit contains five 11-inch pizza crusts and five pouches of perfectly proportioned pizza sauce. Now, the best part is you can top it with your family's favorite ingredients to create a pizza that's as delicious as it is nutritious. Whether you're a busy professional looking for a quick and healthy dinner option, a health-conscious family seeking a fun and interactive meal activity, or a pizza lover who wants to indulge in a guilt-free way, our Plant Strong Pizza Crust Kit has got you covered. Join us on the Plant Strong journey and experience the strong benefits of a whole food, plant-based lifestyle. Order your Plant Strong Pizza Crust Kit by visiting plantstrongfoods.com and let me know how you like it. Thanks so much for listening. And now let's dive into today's show. When I talk about optimum nutrition, when I want to describe that bullseye, I just use five words, whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic plants. So if you can eat whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic plants, you're hitting the bullseye. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. For over 35 years, I have been thriving by living Plan Strong. So imagine my surprise when someone tells me that my diet is just okay. In fact, he would only give me a B- minus on my daily nutrition what? I wasn't sure if I should be offended or intrigued, but I definitely, definitely was inspired to learn more. Today, I welcome Dr. Doug Graham to the Plan Strong podcast. If you don't know who Doug is, he is best known for developing and authoring the 80-10-10 way of eating. That's when 80% of your calories are coming from carbohydrates, specifically in the form of raw fruits and vegetables. 10% are coming from protein, and the remaining 10% come from fat. Now, not only does Doug live this way, but he actually wrote the book about it back in 2006. I have been intrigued by Doug's work and rationale for a long time, especially since my good friends Robbie Barbero and Cyrus Kambata of Mastering Diabetes, who have been on the podcast several times follow and were inspired by his diet protocol and speak so highly of him. I got to say that this conversation was eye-opening for me and I learned a bunch about the history of why we eat, how we eat, why cooked food may not be all it's cracked up to be and how I can level up my own plate each day. The conversation takes some twists and turns and I love that it got me thinking differently, and I hope it does the same for you too. Enjoy. Dr. Doug Graham, welcome to the Plan Strong Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. I know you're over in UK and it's it's turning into evening there. Here in Austin, Texas, it's high noon for me. Um, Lucky you. Yeah, lucky me. Um, But Doug, you are... You are an absolute legend. You have inspired and I think uh, helped so many of us, uh, you know, with the information uh, that's required in kind of adapting a whole food plant-based diet. But you are also 
you're also you're intense. You're an intense, you're an intense guy. And uh, I think you're, you know, you like to call it the 811 or the 801010. You're the 801010 dude. I mean, you 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 truly are. This is your book right here. 801010, right? Wow, I'm like honored. The, and and when when did you first write this book? Was it early 2000s? Uh, the first time I wrote 801010 the phrase 801010 was 1999. I was in the middle of a lecture and it and I was trying to make a specific point because there were some people interviewing about opening up a health retreat in Hawaii and they wanted it to be something special different than anything that's already been done. So I said, well let's let's make it 801010 intentionally because that's what I use with athletes, that's what I use with performers of all you know, on every kind, but anybody who wants to get the maximum performance, whether they're piano players, thinkers, whatever they were. So I, but it was the first time it ever made it onto a board. Now I'm not the originator of the concept 80, 10, 10. Um, <clears throat> I have seen other vegan doctors use that phrase, uh, but they use the phrase 80, 10, 10. Uh, <clears throat> and I, coined that into the 80 10 10 diet so i i created that but i didn't really i didn't come up with the idea uh this is a natural idea this is what all of the animals that are anatomically and physiologically like us that's how they eat they eat very close to 80 10 10 or within the guidelines of 80 10 10 and then it turned out that that that's how all the long-lived people on the planet eat and all of the top performance athletes tend to eat the vast majority of top performance athletes also tend to eat that way so i just started thinking like if it's working for athletes and it's working for long-lived people and and golly gee i can't think of a teacher who didn't tell me eat more fruits and vegetables that are really good for you so I just said, I wonder what would happen if I eat fruits and vegetables to the exclusion of everything else, since everything else isn't as good for me as fruits and vegetables are. Wonder what would happen if, you know, that famous human phrase. So I tried it on myself first and it, the results were just astonishing. I mean, astonishing. Uh, mostly the clarity of mind, uh, which translated into but but let me ask you this you when you say you tried it on yourself yeah you tried it on yourself but did you have like how were you eating at the time did you have any like health scares or anything that inspired you or were you just searching for a better way of eating and i know that and i know there was an individual tc fry that really also helped you know it was a mentor of yours and you mm -hmm. hold him in the highest regard i do yeah. um at the time i was eating as a vegan I'd been a vegetarian for seven years before that. Uh, I was vegan only though for about seven months mm. and then said, gee, I wonder this vegan thing is really good. I like what it's doing. I feel better for it. Uh, my endurance improved as a vegan. My, but I wonder what would happen if I just switched to essentially go from vegan to raw vegan, change starches over for fruits. And But that's when the that's when the clarity of mind hit. That's when the reduction of need for sleep by about two hours a night, just like night and day, all of a sudden I don't need anywhere near as much sleep and I still have just as much energy. Uh, that's when the digestion perfection set in. And that's when, that's when the, my memory improved. I was just shocked. My memory, like, Wow, important things, right? Like when we're a kid, we do all we can to dull our senses. Uh, but as adults, we're kind of doing everything we can to become as aware and as self-aware as possible. And, and the self-awareness that happened just from a diet change, it, it took me the best part of a decade to accumulate the science to be able to explain what was going on. Now, because we haven't 
All we know right now is that you're the, for the people that are listening that, that, okay, huh? that don't know what 80, 10, 10 is, right? It means absolutely nothing to them. Uh, let's start with, let's start with 80. Well, you what know, it, yeah. Or you tell uh, me how you first want to I wanna say, yeah. first I want to yeah. say the things I didn't say, uh, yeah. I'm honored to be here on stage with you. I'm honored to be in this meeting. Uh, you are all, you are a legend. You are, a, are, you know, your whole family is some people I look up to. I met your dad back in 94. Wow. You know, but I still remember it. And, um, and talked to him many times on the phone and he was always ever so helpful and gracious and, and and you are you are just banging it out, making vegans happen, and I'm super proud of you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Eighty ten ten is a very simple concept. We're looking at three macronutrients, as they're known in the world of nutrition, or what I call caloronutrients, because it's the only three nutrients that give us calories, and those are protein, fat, and carbohydrate. But I list them with protein in the middle. So it's carbohydrate on one end, fat on the other, protein in the middle because like a seesaw, yeah. the, the protein consumption of, Amer of humans all the way around the world only varies by a point or two. All the way around the world, no matter what diet you're on, unless you're on an extreme Western end diet in which case it might vary by three or four points. Uh, the worldwide average is 11% of calories from protein. And if you look at the people who are low, it'll be down to about nine and the people who are high are up to about 12 or 13. Uh, if you're supplementing with protein, obviously you can boost it way up. But if you're eating food, it's nine to nine to 11 is about what people are eating in terms of protein. So I just said 10. Uh, these numbers aren't aren't set in stone. We're not trying to be exact. We're just trying to give a guideline. And and so what had to happen was we either had to then favor fat or favor carbohydrate. And as we've seen with vegan diets, as we've seen with most diets around the world, they favor carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are readily available. Fats are kind of hard to come by. Um, in nature, fats are hard to come by uh, unless you're wealthy enough to afford to buy the, the fats. Poor people don't eat a lot of fats. They eat a lot of starch. And so I just, like I said, I wondered what would happen is if I, if I, took, the, if I took the starch and replaced it with simple sugars, which is what our body uses for fuel anyway, so we don't have to go through that whole digestion process to access the fuel that we're eating. And what happens is you cut down your, you cut down your effort in digestion. You cut down the calories needed to convert the starch to sugar mm -hmm. because everything we eat gets converted into glucose. As you know, it's all going down to glucose or else it's being stored as fat. So the 80 was a guideline for how much of your total calories should come from carbohydrate in an ideal world. If we're looking for optimum heart health, optimum cellular health, optimum, optimum performance on every level, 80 to 90% of calories want to come from carbohydrate. Now, Doug, Doug, I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, interject here because I know you could just go on forever, and I want I want um, to ask questions because so many I think people hear. Wait, this guy's saying eighty to ninety percent of calories coming from carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Like I thought, carbohydrates, carbs were bad. You know, the, so much of the noise we hear. Maybe it's not as much as loud in the UK, but here in the, is. state, the states mm -hmm. is that you know, you know, carbs are bad. We want to eat a uh, a high kind of high protein um, high protein diet. Um, and, uh, and, and carbs are like 20%. If, if I'm not, you know, the, I mean, car the carnivore diet is, is huge here. The keto diet, you know, Atkins is kind of by the wayside now, but I think it's paleo keto and carnivore are the new kids in the block. Um, but those are the new kids on the block. And if you study your history a little bit, what you'll find is that this, the paleo concept or the Atkins concept or the, 
Hollywood concept or the yeah. whatever you want to call it, the high the high fat, high protein concept has come into vogue eight times in the last 140 years, every 20 years. And it came into vogue in, in 1880 and 1900 and 1920 and 40 and 60 and 80 and, and again and, and now again. And every time it failed, when it came into vogue in the 1960s, people started dying uh, and it, and because there was a, a high protein approach that was available on grocery store shelves and they had to take it off the shelves, made it illegal. The only way you could access it for a while was through uh, medical prescription. Right. But then some doctor somewhere figured out that when you're in ketosis, you don't tend to have as many seizures. Right. And they started using they started using keto as a temporary approach to quell the seizures while they looked for other things to do like get you a dog that tells you you're gonna have a seizure yeah. or the other things that could be done but they knew for a fact that because keto is a failure to thrive diet you can't live on it that it had to be a temporary measure even for even for seizures somehow that mushroomed that caught on and they started saying, oh, it's good for this. It's good for that. It's good for everything. Uh, and certainly in an obese society, anything that puts you into failure to thrive will cause you to, re to lose weight. So for the people whose only concern was weight loss, they said, the heck with my health. I want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Why does it work? It works really well because you can have all the meat you want which is what people were already doing. And you can have all the butter you want, but nothing to put it on. Mm -hmm. So how much are you going to eat? If there's not, what are you going to put it on? If it's, you're not going to put it on, how much butter are you going to put on a slice of meat? You know? Mm -hmm. So people didn't really change their diet that much. They just took out carbs, which was on a standard Western diet, that's 45% of their calories. Mm -hmm. In America, people eat about 45, 10, 45. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you cut out 45 <clears throat> and replace it with nothing, because you're not adding much fat, you're not adding protein, you're just doing what you've always been doing. But Doug, explain to me, explain to me and the people that are listening that are, that are thinking, so, okay, if, if most people were eating 45, 10, 45, 40. that's it. but, but if you're eating all that meat and all that dairy, isn't that protein higher than 10 or, or 11 or 12? No. no, no, really. I mean, on the, uh, on a really well to do American diet, if we'll call it the American diet on a yeah. really well to do American diet, an American might be eating 15 or even 16% of their calories from protein, but that's it. Doesn't go much higher than that. Almost not without supplementation. And so is that because uh, I think you say it in your book, uh, basically, like, if you're eating meat, you're basically eating fat. Is that is that right? Well, it depends on the cut of meat. Yeah. Well, what I said in the book is that we describe, if we're going to have to choose, <clears throat> excuse me, if we're yeah. going to have to choose what to call a, a food, is it a protein, a fat, or a carbohydrate, we do that by its predominating nutrient. So potatoes are predominated by carbohydrate. We call it a carbohydrate. Yeah. But bacon is predominated by fat, but we call it a protein. I, that seems odd to me. Chicken breast is predominated by protein. We should call it a protein. There's not as much fat unless you fry it. But, um, but most of the meats are predominated by fat, and we should call them fat. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we don't. We don't like to... We're, we're very funny about our names. Yeah. A lot of, we do a lot of funny stuff by calling things what it really isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to your 80. Good. 80, 80, 80, 80. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, yeah. I can answer a funny part of this question because the 80, 10, 10 people always ask about the 80, but the 80 is what's left. When, when we, you can look at any kind of doctor you want from A to Z 
or at least to X. And you can look at you can look at any kind of doctor you want, from the radiologists, you know, all the way down, and any disease you can name, and the doctors will recommend three to 10% of your calories coming from protein. And you can look at any kind of sport. You can look at any type of health from cancer, diabetes, heart disease. It doesn't matter what the condition. And doctors recommend three to 10% of your calories from fat. Well, if you're only taking in three to 10 and you're only taking in three to 10, there's got to be at least 80 to 90 left. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so carbohydrates are really what's left after you have all the protein and all the fat that you possibly can and stay, yeah. stay out of that range where you get predictable health decline. Now, when you say three, yeah. When, now, when you say three to 10 on the, on the fat, you're, mm -hmm. I would imagine you're referring to doctors like McDougal, my father, Ornish, Clapper, am, am I mistaken? Because I think most doctors, all of them, uh, certainly all of them are saying. Most doctors I know, most doctors I know are completely clueless when it comes to nutrition and, and, and well, food. for certain, okay. for certain. But if we look at cardiologists, specialists who, who do know a bit more, not just the responsible vegan doctors that we all are familiar with. Yeah. But we'll, if you, you know what, if you want to get into more reliable science than medicine, which is kind of take, I mean, I think they've dropped the ball enough times now that we're not necessarily listening to them anymore. But if you want to get into some reliable science, look at sports science, look at sports physiology. Mm. Sports physiology has to be reproducible. If, if somebody gets certain results and it's in a sports physiology book that this is what's going to happen, when you do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. It's very reliable. It's not tied to the entire cartel of pharmacology yet anyway. And you can, you can pretty well trust what you read in a sports physiology text when it comes to nutrition. They're going to tell you fruits and vegetables. They're going to tell you high carbohydrate. They're going to tell you lower your fat because when the fat goes up, your ability to bring oxygen to the cells is reduced. When the fat goes up, 1959, the Journal of American Medical Association published that when the fat goes up in your diet, it becomes all but impossible to get sugar out of your bloodstream to your cells. They define diabetes by saying all you have to do is lower the fat in your diet and there is no diabetes, no potential for it, no way for it to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's remarkable. Type two. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Speaking of speaking of which, and you know, the other day, well, two individuals that speak so incredibly high of you and they become really close personal friends of mine are I Cyrus. Can. <laughs> Cyrus, Cyrus and, and Robbie of Mastering Diabetes. And sure. those two think the world of you. And you have been so helpful, I think, with, with them and inspiring them with everything they're doing. And I have, you know, whenever they come to my house, they literally will bring a huge, like 10 pound box of their, their mangoes, their bananas, their plantains, you know, I mean, fruits that I've never seen in my life. And it is, you know, in, in large part because of, of what you have taught these guys. And so that let's, 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 let's talk about fruit because you are a huge proponent of fruit. Like yeah. it's like you are, you should be like Dr. Fruit. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so why well, are you, you why eat more fruit than anybody alive? I know that for fact. Wow. But, wow. Well, I want to talk about that. I never thought that would be a claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so what do you love so much about fruit and um, why is it so important? <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever tasted mother's milk, but it's sweet and juicy. Okay. It's sweet and juicy. Yep. And, and it's got some other qualities too, right? Everything a baby needs. And those, and those baby teeth, they're called milk teeth. Well, 
babies can digest mother's milk, but we adults can't because we stop producing lactase in order to digest the lactose. Mm. And, and, and that happens to kids, that loss of lactase happens in their late single digit years or early double digit years as their milk teeth start to fall out the two things happen in in concert and then suddenly mother's milk doesn't taste so good because it gives you an upset tummy every time and they start they switch over to whatever their parents eat mm -hmm. which is what every animal in the entire animal kingdom does is they go from whatever they ate as babies and they switch over to whatever their parents eat so in the world of of comparative anatomy where we say that all animals that are anatomically and physiologically similar thrive on similar foods we can look at the five anthropoid primates they all eat 80 10 10 they all eat fruits and vegetables their babies are weaned onto fruits and vegetables we're the only exception and there's no reason for us to be an exception because there's no exceptions in in a in a rule that starts with all <laughs> so right when we when we lose those milk teeth they are replaced by another set of teeth that the only name i've heard for them other than primary and secondary teeth all right when we talk about we talk about milk teeth for the kids i mean that's just a a name right it's not really the official name yeah and the, and the only unofficial name i've ever heard for your secondary teeth is the name that you've heard too sweet tooth because we were we were raised on mother's milk sweet and juicy and it's what we're born for we are we are sweet seekers that's why the first taste buds are most susceptible or most able to taste sweet more than any other taste it's why kids put things in their mouth to see if it's sweet and then we somehow in our wisdom we managed to pervert if i can say that word uh, we've managed to pervert our sweet tooth and we have coffee and cake mm -hmm. we have milk and cookies we have ice cream and soda we always have we end up with sweet and juicy no matter how we do it brownies and hot chocolate you know it always ends up sweet and juicy this is what we love mm -hmm. we're always looking for sweet and juicy it sounds good sweet and juicy i mean who wouldn't want a sweet and juicy life so the trick was could i eat sweet and juicy while not compromising my health well every health teacher i've ever had told me eat more fruits and vegetables fruits are good for you 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 gotta eat your vegetables eat your fruit and vegetables i mean that so it became a no-brainer for me to say eat more fruit the only thing was I had no models i asked every raw food leader in the world all four of them at the time what would you do i'm an athlete i want to be a, i want to be continue to be an athlete what diet would you put me on and they all said well it'd be a raw food diet not cooked and then i said okay so what does that look like and all four said i have no idea we've never done that for an athlete we've only helped sick people get well Okay, so you've only that's the only experience you have because those are the only people desperate enough at the time. Yeah, but now yeah. we're finding lots of people desperate enough. Uh, lots of people are realizing that their health is a very important thing, and when you don't have it, it becomes the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, eating sweet just became a natural thing, and I started eating fruit for breakfast, and that, that wasn't a big deal. And then I started eating fruit for breakfast and lunch, and that wasn't a big deal and but it wasn't enough calories from fruit to meet my athletic needs so i started eating fruit for breakfast and fruit for lunch and then all the fruit i care for before my giant dinner salad vegetables all i care for so volume wise i eat about the same amount of fruit as vegetables in terms of calories 85 percent of my calories come from 
carbohydrates from fruit. Well, so when you say you're eating fruit for breakfast and fruit for lunch, give me an example of what that looks like. Oh, you know, it might be four or five mangoes for breakfast. Could be could be a dozen bananas for lunch. About yeah. about a thousand calories. About twelve hundred calories if I'm training hard. If I'm really like I'm going down to Costa Rica for six weeks, I'm going to be doing some serious training. I'll be eating four thousand calories a day down there. Uh huh. In which case, I'm eating closer to 12, 1300 calories breakfast, again, lunch, and again, dinner. So even my dinner meal is going to start with maybe two, three quarts, two, three quarts, no, two quarts maybe of orange juice or orange mango juice or orange pineapple juice or some blend of juicy fruits. And so, and so that's interesting to me. So, because I know in your book, you talk about how you always prefer the whole kind of the whole food as opposed to kind of like juicing. Um, yeah. So how, how much, how much are you, are you juicing throughout the day or and you tell no. your, no. Okay. No. okay. But I'll, but I'll, I'll make an exception for citrus because I'm just removing the edible portion of the citrus. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not really throwing anything away. Even if there's a little pulp left over, it'll go into the salad Kind of, it would be kind of like making tomato juice in a juicer. And then what do you do with the pulp? Well, you make, you make salad dressing out of the pulp or you make something else out of the pulp. So it's not that you can't. Yeah. Uh, but I don't juice as a rule. I don't think juicing is better for me. Um, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not attacking juicing. I'm not attacking anything. But I don't think it's as good for us as whole food. I'm not going to throw away the whole food concept just because juices are, are fun to drink. They're certain, I'm, I mean, people ask how come they get better on juices, you know, if juices are so bad. And I'm saying, I'm not saying they're bad. The reason people get better on juices is because they stopped eating crap. You can't juice Twinkies. You can't juice a burger. Right. You know? So, right. so they, it becomes their juice and vegetables and fruits. They get better. Yeah. But I also open any nutrition book and I see that fiber is a nutrient an important and essential nutrient that, you know, we need to get from our food. We need to get fiber. It makes no sense to me to remove the fiber. It's kind of funny. If you go buy breakfast cereal, it has fiber added, but then for dinner, you want to like have juice with din with fiber extracted and both are supposed to be better for you than yeah. whole food. And I don't buy it. I I'm saying whole food's the best. Uh, so for me, I'll, I'll just eat mangoes for breakfast. Okay, again, I'm going for performance and and I know my mindset is I don't I'm not I'm not like I don't compete as a general rule. I st my competitive years as an athlete ended a long time ago, but I I did want to go to nationals once, so Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm going to go to powerlifting nationals this year. But I'm not looking to compete. I'm not crazy about my sport, but I still want to be healthy. I still want to be dynamic. I still want to be able to play with anybody who invites me to come out and play with them or do anything with them. Hey, you need to rake leaves all day. Fine. Okay. You need to throw pitchfork all day. Fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, if that's what needs to be done, let's get it done. We're going to move bricks. Great. Let's move. I want to be able, I love being able bodied. And I find for myself and I openly admit that I fought the concept like, no, <laughs> but mono meals work better. Simple, simple, simple. Mo I mean, when it's persimmon season, eat persimmon. When it's banana season, eat bananas. When it's lychee season, eat lychee. Uh, so you're I'm not, okay. right, right. So mono eating, you can, you're fine if you just, for, for lunch, I have 12 bananas. Right. Yeah. Call it good. Or 12 persimmon or, or yeah. 15 peaches or whatever's in season at the time. Yeah. Which is a, which is a way of thinking that I think most of us, uh, or a way of eating that most of us have never done, or we think, you know oh, yeah, I yeah. think, I think it's, a, I'm sorry, I cut you off. That was rude. No, 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 it's okay. But, but, and, and as you said earlier, what's interesting is if you were to look at the, what, 15 or 20,000 mammals that we share the planet with, they mono eat, don't they? All of them. All of them. 
So we're really the there's only no, ones that don't. There's no bear. There's yeah. no bear. Like bears eat a lot of different food, right? But there's no bear that goes down to the river, gets a salmon, and then go raids a beehive yeah. and spread some honey on the salmon and then goes collect some blueberries and puts that on top of the honey because it will stick and then goes back to the river gets another salmon puts it on top and has a big salmon witch like what they don't do that right they, when it's salmon time they eat salmon when it's bear but the thing is if we could only just go back in time 140 years which isn't that many generations mm-hmm you know, and if you could just go back 140 years when 95% of the people lived rural and only 5% lived urban, that's completely switched now. When 95% of the people lived rural and there was apples falling off the apple tree, mm-hmm. you ate apples. Right. And when the peaches fell just before that, you ate peaches. And when the cherries fell just before that, you ate cherries. What when about the, the potato crop? <laughs> well, when the potato crop came in, you ate potatoes. Yeah. You know, and it was and it was pretty darn simple. So I think it is the way I know uh, you know, <clears throat> not not that mi- None of us, really. I mean, for me, I felt like I was inventing something, but I knew I really wasn't. I was just going back to the roots Mm -hmm. of the way humans are designed to eat simply at every meal, variety through the course of the year, because that's what nature provides for us is phenomenal variety. Most things are only in peak of season for three or four weeks. Yeah. Doug, I... There's a lot I want to unpack with you here because I'm, I'm serious. I, in reading your book, I just was like, my jaw was kind of on the ground kind of thinking, wow, I can't believe that I didn't know this or this runs counter to a lot of the information that I, that I'm currently, uh, how I currently view things. So I, I'd love to start to unpack some of that. And let's start with, You've said you're, you're, I mean, your 80, 10, 10 plan is you're about raw. You're not a fan of cooked. And, you know, I'd say that I probably eat 40% of my food is 40, 50 is raw and 40, 50 is, is cooked, but you're not a, by what unit, uh, by what unit I would say by volume. Oh, okay. By volume. Not by calorie. Not by calorie. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's more than that by calorie. Pro- it probably is. It probably not by is. cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but, but so we got to have a unit. Let's always use a unit, or we confuse people. Okay, okay, good, good. And I know you talk about that, you know, very definitively in the book. Um, but so what? Why? Why are you not such a fan of like, let's say, you know, potatoes, bread, pasta, grains, whole, you know, whole intact grains, rice, beans. Uh, I'd love for you to explain that. Okay. It's easy to do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to do two things. One, if we look at the target, the target has a series of rings with a bullseye in the middle. Why we call it the bullseye. Well, that's a separate conversation. Why we name so many things with animal parts, but, um, yeah, <laughs> but we do, I mean, che- peaches have cheeks and, Mangoes have shoulders and da 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 da. So, um, <clears throat> if we look at the bullseye, fruits and vegetables are in the middle of that target. They're the healthiest foods for us. And if I'm looking to take the best care of myself, I'm going to eat the foods that are best for me. And anything else is second best at best, you know, third best, fourth best, whatever. I'm not saying anything is, you know, it's not good, bad, or whatever. It's just fruits and vegetables are best. So I can eat fruits and vegetables. Why wouldn't I? But we can look at it from the from the downside, if you want, instead, and look up from the downside. And the downside is is what I call gens. And we we understand gens. Gen means the origin of something like in Genesis, right, or genetics. We're looking at the origin of things. And in the gens, there are five specific gens that are associated with cooked food. 
And it doesn't matter what kind of cooked food and it doesn't matter how we cook them. But the longer we cook them and the higher temperature we cook them, the more gens we develop, we create. Now the gens were first discovered over a hundred years ago by a doctor, a French doctor named Maillard. Oh yeah. And he eventually coined the phrase a Maillard reaction. Yep. And that's a, that's a little more complicated to go into what happens when we make Maillard reactions, but there's, there's four different chemicals that are formed in Maillard reactions, all of which are carcinogenic. So the gen, okay? And anytime we heat foods, we create carcinogens. So that's the first gen. And, and, and it doesn't matter where you look. I don't care whose source you want to go. You heat foods, you create carcinogens. AGEs and PH, PCHs and, and partially combusted hydrocarbons and, and acrylamides, arom aromatic yeah. benzene rings of all, all sorts of carcinogens. Anyway, um, but we also create substances that are called tumorigens. They're the origin of tumors and tremorogens, mm. the origin of all the men. There's lots of different kinds of tremors that humans can have. Their origins lie in substances created when we cook food. There's, there's another kind of gen that is called a mutagen. And what a mutagen does is it, it stops a cell from reproducing itself perfectly. Mm. When a cell doesn't reproduce itself perfectly, that's called a mutation. And, and that is the explanation of aging. That's how aging happens, is cells stop reproducing themselves perfectly, and we get these little changes, and we call them aging. So mutagens are, are, are actually what the aging process is all about. And these mutagens are not in existence in raw foods, but they are in cooked, mm. including bread, rice, pasta, corn, potatoes, and oats. Mm. The big gen, probably the one most people, well, I don't know which one they're most concerned about, but the big gen to me is called the teratogen. Now, teratogen hasn't made a lot of popularity in the you know public mind, but if we look up teratogens, what we find out is that they're not that damaging to us in ways we can notice until we have babies. The damage happens to the babies. Hmm. So if you remember thalidomide from the 1960s, you're not old enough to remember it, but there was a drug called thalidomide, which was used by a bunch of pregnant ladies to help them with their morning sickness, and, and, and it helped. They didn't have so much headaches. But the babies were born with no arms and no legs, just hands and feet sticking out of their shoulders and hips. Yep. Terrible, terrible teratogen. And we're seeing that same teratogenic effect happen when we heat starches. We're seeing that carcinogenic effect happen to the point where there are now laws in California and many other states that heating starches in a restaurant or any eating establishment must be accompanied by a sign that says they're doing so because there's carcinogens being released into the air. And every restaurant in California has that sign on the outside of their door. You're not allowed to enter. Well, you're supposed to see the sign. There are also signs uh, for the carcinogens that are formed when we heat fats. And again, if you remember the whole deal with trans fats and how cooking with trans fats became illegal in fast food establishments because of the carcinogens released into the air. So if we look at all those gens, none of them are good for us. They all happen as a result of cooking food. That's before you get into anti-nutrients, which also happen when we cook food. The loss of nutrients that occurs when we cook food. Those are two things. 
Loss of nutrients is one thing. Anti-nutrients is yet another. Both happen when we cook. And so I just, I mean, I didn't, I never had an aspiration to become a raw vegan, trust me. But once I learned this information, I couldn't, man, I just couldn't not see it. I couldn't yeah. not at least find out for myself what would happen if I tried it. And, and I did an interview with a lady, a young lady from college. She was doing a paper and she talked to me for about 40 minutes. And at the end of it, she goes, look, this, this all sounds great, but it also sounds like a lot of effort on your part to make sure there's food on the table. She goes, it's just a lot of effort socially. You're like the outcast and whatever yeah. else. Right. And she goes, is it really worth it? And my response is, well, how stupid do you think I am? And she goes, what do you mean? I go, I've been doing this for more than 40 years. You think if it wasn't worth it, maybe I would have stopped a couple of years ago or maybe 30 or 40 years ago if it wasn't worth it? Of course it's worth it. That's why I'm still doing it 40 years down the line because it's working so well that I can still go out and play with kids. That I mean, I'm going to be 70 in a couple of weeks and I'm, I'm still performing as I like to say, everything still works just fine, you know, yeah. and, and I'm so glad that it does. And I don't think I'm a genetic freak. It's not just, you know, like God picked me out of the universe. <clears throat> um, it works for everybody. I used to tell people like you'll extend your athletic career by five or 10 years, but I was completely wrong. It's, I don't even know how long it is. I, Pam Bodler on the 80 10 10 was 45 years old when she won national championships in sprint canoe. The wow. next oldest competitor was 23. That's I mean, incredible. sprints, sprint sports are kid sports, right? And yeah. the next oldest competitor was 23. She won it at 45. And, and there, there really wasn't even a second place. It, second place was so far back. It should have been third or fourth or something. If she'd competed in the men's, she would have took third. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was unreal. Doug, so, let me, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. So you know the work of um, of Dan Butner in the Blue Zones, right? And the, the, the kind of the commonality there are really beans, the the legumes between those five different populations. You know of the work, uh, um, well, Okinawans uh, that you know. I think it's seventy seven percent of their their diet is from carbohydrates from the Okinawan sweet potato. Okay. So so I mean, tell me. Are all these gens being created as well in potatoes and, and beans and legumes? Absolutely, yes. They are. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Uh -huh. Now, you don't so, get a browning reaction if you cook stuff in water, right? Like, so you're not, you don't get that whole Maillard series of events mm -hmm. um, when you cook stuff in water. So that that's when you boil food, it's not quite as as harmful but but there is another side to that whole story right you remember remember when you were eight and nine years old you remember going to school back then or have you blocked all that out no i remember yeah. okay well about once a week or so you'd get to do some art and or at least we did about once a week we'd get to do some art and the teacher maybe one week we'd paint and one week we'd draw or i don't know what but uh, art was never my thing but occasionally we'd get a whole bunch of paper and scissors and, and we were told not to run around with the scissors, but we'd get a whole bunch of paper, colored paper, scissors and paste. Yeah. And you, and you make some kind of layered thing to try to make pictures out of paper and paste. Right. And the teacher had one instruction for you. Don't eat the paste. The glue. Now, yeah. Not glue. We, no, didn't get, we didn't get glue. That's made from horse's hooves. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We got paste, white school paste. That's made from flour and water. Uh -huh. And we were told, don't eat the paste. And I find it astonishing that every teacher in every school told every child, don't eat the paste. But all these vegan doctors are out there telling people, eat paste. It's good for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we'll change the name. We won't call it paste. 
we'll run it through a press and then strain it out, extrude it, and we'll call it pasta instead. That'll fool them. It won't be paste anymore. It'll be pasta. Or, or the French will add sugar and we'll call it pastry. They're not hiding the name all that well. The Spanish will add sugar and eggs and call it pastel. Mm. It's all paste, man. And, and the teachers, we're not, we're not designed to eat paste, man. It's got no vitamin C. Basically, 1952, there was a guy won a Nobel Prize for his work with vitamin C. Do you know who that was? Is that Lionel Pauling? It sure was. You won a Nobel Prize. And what he said is that we need to be eating 10 to 100 times more vitamin C than we are. And the only way he could see to do that was to supplement with pills. And everybody laughed him off the planet and said, who's going to eat 100 times as much vitamin C, Linus? But somebody didn't laugh because they gave him a Nobel Prize. I yeah. think he's the only guy to win two Nobel Prizes in two completely different Anyway, so he won this thing, and I think he was on to something because when I analyze the vitamin C content of a diet made up of fruits and vegetables, yep. it's exactly the amount of vitamin C that Linus Pauling said we need to take. So I'm taking in all that vitamin C. It's, it's 1980 since the last time I was seriously ill of any kind of way. Um <sighs> I don't know what he suggested seems to be working really spot on as far as I can tell. You know, I talked to Dr. Howell before he died, the guy who said, well, we need to be taking in all these enzymes. Everybody needs enzymes. I said, Dr. Howell, does everybody need them? He goes, well, not. I mean, if you're eating nothing but fruits and vegetables, you wouldn't need them. But who does that? I said, mm -hmm. well, you just described my diet. He mm -hmm. goes, well, then you don't need enzymes. You're getting everything you need out of your food. Mm -hmm. Food isn't the answer to all of mankind's problems. I'm first to say it's not even all the answers to nutrition. You still get your vitamin D from the sun and you get your B12 from microbes, for goodness sakes. But if we can't cover the very, very basics of eating well, eating at least to the point where your diet is predominated by fruits and vegetables, I think we're missing the boat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What... Um so you you mentioned so for example you know Nathan Pritikin who sure. who amazing pioneer um, you say that where he got it wrong was that he grouped the natural sugars that were contained in fruit with the sugars you know with other sugars and uh, and that that was his kind of fatal mistake um, even though he was able to reverse heart disease doing that so your contention is you can reverse some of these diseases eating this way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy. Well, it, it certainly doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy. Health is tough to pin down the yeah. de a definition, but even, even his biggest supporters. And as you saw, I wrote a big section about it in the book, right? Yeah. Even his biggest supporters said he missed the boat entirely because he, yes, if it was just weight management or it was just heart disease and that was our only concern and we weren't concerned that while we're stopping heart disease we're causing cancer well okay but if we are trying to not prevent this and prevent that but instead cause something the thing we'd be trying to cause would be health mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if i'm trying to create health you know um what do they call it? The 4-H Society. They run those contests for flower shows and prize hogs and whatnot. Mm -hmm, and, the mm -hmm. and the person who provides the substances, forces, influences, conditions that are optimum for that African violet or for that hog or for that whatever the animal or plant, the person who provides the optimum conditions or the closest to it for the most time pr produces the prize winning plant or animal and that's what we try to do with our kids we try to give them the optimum conditions and we tell them no you can't drink alcohol as a three-year-old no you can't smoke cigarettes just because grandpa does and no you can't have a cup of coffee it'll stunt your health it'll stunt your growth it'll ruin your this that or the next yeah and then we turn into teenagers and we see how much can we abuse ourselves and still 
you know, get to work the next day or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then 20 years later, we go, wow, I was destroying my health. Now my health is really important to me again. I, I need to expand my heart. I need to start taking better care. Mickey Mantle said it best, yeah. right? He said, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have took better care of myself. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Doug, this is so uh, compelling, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out here the direction I oh, want to go you, at this point. You be careful, Rip, talking to me, because I'm going to have you doing a raw food experiment before <laughs> no. we're done. Before well, I'm I, back I, on the show, you'll have done the experiment. No. Well, and, and, and know that, you know, I mean, know that, you know, my, my world has been – you know, fruits, vegetables, whole intact grains, leg, legumes, you know, limited amounts of, of nuts and seeds and avocados, you know. And, huge, and, uh, and well, it's got to be the next best thing to what I'm doing. Right, right. So so if yours is an A, you would call what I'm eating, what, a B? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Okay. All right. C, B minus? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 All right. And, and know that, you know. But I know you enough to know that you don't want to see. Right, right. And I know you don't want to see. Right. And know that, you know, the people that, I've, that I have held up on a very high pedestal uh, have been, you know, the McDougals and my father mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the Ornishes and these people. And, and so what's, what's tough for me to, to kind of reconcile and, that I'm, and I'm taking this in is that you know, am I going to stop my, my, my rice and my lentils and my black beans and my, my tacos, you know, with corn tortillas? And I think you're saying, yeah, if you, you don't want to get a C any longer, you might want to think about that. Um, you know, even though, even though, you know, this, this has reversed heart disease, reversed diabetes, type two diabetes and sure. some other things, right. Um, sure. It's the human propensity to get well. It's the nat health is the natural state of humans. You've your diet is so clean compared to your next door neighbor's diet yeah. that you would think that you had an A plus plus plus. Yeah. Because they're failing. So it, you know, it's like they say if you want to look young and healthy and trim and fit. Hang around with a bunch of ugly, fat, old people. Or, you know? <laughs> so when you compare yourself to a diet that's an absolute abysmal failure, yours shines like, yeah. And it's, and it's where I went after I gave up on standard American diet and and moved away from macro neurotic diet and then moved away from vegetarian and then eventually became a vegan, and and those are all steps in a direction that is improvement. There was improvement every time. Yeah. The smallest step of all of them is from what you're doing to what I'm doing. That's Let the tiniest step, but it'll give you the biggest results. Right, right, which, which to me is super exciting. So you're much more an advocate of a fruit and vegetable. I, should, should I say fruit and and some vegetables or fruit and veggie? How do you like to describe that? But fruit and veggie versus low-fat starch-based starch -based diet. Yeah, I don't want to eat starches. No, There's no, no. vitamin C. Uh, it's just paste. It's all, you know, now, it, look, I love starch. I'm not going to tell you for a second that I didn't love ribs on a – spare ribs on a grill. I love that too, okay? I love yeah. everything that I ever ate when I was a kid or I didn't eat it. And when I went vegan, it was like, wow, this is the best thing ever. I get to eat all the starch I want. But it but it didn't serve me in so many ways that I can name if you want, but it didn't serve me in so many ways that I said, there's got to be, how come I'm meeting all these raw vegans? Why do they keep telling me there's something better out there? I got to find out. Yeah. But, so, but, but as you say in your book, Doug, most raw vegans don't even get it right. Right, because they're eating sixty percent of their calories from fat. Correct, and and so well, when the book was written, that was correct. You know, um, eight. Oh, now it's it's ten years ago since since I went to Slovenia for a raw food festival in Slovenia. Yeah, and the people who put on that festival also invited a lot of press to come. And it was a big deal. It was so different, right? So wild. And so the press came. Um, and one of the interviews that I did, 
the news lady said, well, I don't know anything about raw foods, Dr. Graham. I mean, I don't even know what, what you're talking about. People keep giving me different terms. When they say raw food, do they mean 80, 10, 10? <laughs> and I looked her in the eye and I said, not yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the raw, there was a big raw food movement 20 years ago. I mean, there were seven festivals in the United States during the course of every summer, and it was a big deal. There's San Francisco and Portland and Syracuse, New York, and, and Miami and, and Atlanta, Georgia. There was festivals all over the place. and But they all self-destructed, right? I mean, they're, they're eating 70 to 80% of their fat, and people are saying it doesn't matter what it is as long as it's raw. And, right. and supplements and stimulants and condiments and irritants and flushes and and i'm going what kind of how can you be telling me that this program is nutritionally optimum but it needs all this intervention you know it it's it's not there was an old t-shirt when i was a kid of, of a mad mad chemist and uh he's in his lab and the you know things are bubbling over and 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 he's wild. He he his hair was crazy. And yeah. And caption said, better living through chemistry. <laughs> and and uh, and then the subcaption, the, the heading across the top of the t-shirt was LSD. <laughs> <laughs> LSD, better living through chemistry. Well, we learned that that we actually can't improve on Mother Nature, like like the old uh the old chiffon commercial, right? Like, don't mess with Mother Nature. You can't get better than nature. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, I just went back to nature and call me a nature boy if you want, you know, but I just went back to nature, said fruits and vegetables, just pick it off the tree, eat it. That's like, it's like from God's hand to yours. Yeah. It's a spiritual experience to pick fruit off a tree. Yeah. Let me, ask, so uh, let me ask you this. So I was in Wisconsin this summer and the little town called Frederick, the grocery stores, I mean, the closest grocery store was, it's just little grocery store. And the produce in there was so pitiful looking. I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you feel? Because to me, almost every grocery store has an abundance of really, I think, freshly ripe, picked, frozen, frozen, um, you know, veg, um, frozen fruit from mangoes to, you know, tropical blends to, you know, berries. Are, are you, are you okay with frozen? Well, so if, if, I yeah. heard, you know, Ralph K, Dr. Ralph K. I heard him give a lecture one time back in 1985 and, and his speaking was so crystal clear. It was the best presentation I'd ever heard on nutrition. It yeah. was just crystal clear. And, and I loved how he distilled things down. So when I talk about optimum nutrition, when I want to describe that bullseye, I just use five words, whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic plants. So if you can eat whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic plants, you're hitting the bullseye. Frozen isn't fresh, but it's the next best thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And if you can't access fresh, well, darn it. I mean, right now, you know, organic organic is better than conventional. I, I'm convinced a thousand times over. But two and sometimes three times a year, organic celery becomes very hard for me to access in England mm -hmm. because it's a seasonal crop. And as the season wears out to the very end, before the next season kicks in, Celery gets abysmal, mm -hmm. but conventional celery still, I mean, it's seasonless. <laughs> so, so, so I, I would imagine that one of the objections that you probably get amongst many is Doug. I mean, this is, this sounds really expensive. It's not, uh, it's not, not at all. I don't spend any more than any of my neighbors spend on their food, except the ones who are living on pure junk mm -hmm. pure junk is really cheap and that's designed that way you know but but compared to I, i'll put my dollar per calorie against your dollar per calorie and yeah i'm not yeah. spending more than you are yeah well that's interesting i know i know like robbie barbero just moved 
to Austin. And the, one of the first things he was asking about where are the good farmers markets. And, you know, he's got a knack for finding produce that's very, very affordable. He'll go to Walmart. He'll go to Walmart and like sure. you know, go, go nuts on the produce at Walmart or wherever. I mean, um, I just put in my food order. I'm going to go pick up food tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and I tell my grocer in advance what I want. And he gives me a pretty darn good discount because of that. Yeah. And I say, look, I want three cases of oranges. I want a case of bananas. I want a case of persimmon, whatever it might be. Uh, I'm paying about half of what I see grocery store prices to be. Nice. What about um, apples? Are you a fan of apples? Me the reason personally? I ask, the, no. the reason I ask is that I can't yeah. eat. I can't eat a lot of apples. I find I eat one apple and there's my stomach is like, okay, that's about all I can handle. It's a really common thing not to be able to handle apples or pears. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really common thing. So I, I, I will not make a meal of apples. I'm not happy if I have to do that. Mm -hmm. My wife digests apples perfectly well. My daughter loves them. She can eat them endlessly with no problem. If wow. I try to eat a lot of apples, I, um, my stomach's the same problem as you. I don't, do well you know we are tropical creatures by design and it's the reason you're wearing a shirt right now is because you stay in the tropics we just call it clothing bedding heat our house whatever we right. do to stay in our own little mini tropical environment if you leave it for more than a few minutes you're cold and then you die um so our nat in our natural world we would never see an apple mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you lived Within a thousand miles of the equator, which is where people are designed to live, you would never ever see an apple because that's a temperate zone fruit. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something in that. I still like an odd apple now and then. I really like it with I really like it with raisins, dates, bananas, an apple in a food processor. Turn it into something with a texture of oatmeal. Uh -huh. <laughs> Speaking yeah, of oats, cinnamon. so you're 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 not even a fan of oats, are you? Because <laughs> I'm eating an oatmeal that's so rich in vitamin C. No, yeah. no starches for me. I don't want wallpaper paste. <laughs> it's <laughs> wallpaper paste, and it doesn't I, mean I, I look. I love bland foods. I love bland foods. Oh the no, my, is, <laughs> my, it's, it's not bland. I just I I love putting fruit on my oatmeal. <laughs> why? Why? Well, yeah. I, I guess you could say, well, actually, oats are like, you know, 18% carbs, 18% um, protein and the rest. No, I'm not, I'm not. No, I'm wrong about that. 18% 18 um, 18 fat, 18% protein, and then the rest is carbohydrate. But I find there's a sweetness to, to oats, but I do like to put fruit on them. Um, why? Um, I guess, because I guess, and, and I know exactly where you're going to go with this, but it's because it's sweet, it, and juicy. <laughs> sweet and juicy. And I find that the whole combination is very satiating. Right. right? And, and you, I'd have, you, yeah. You know what? You know how they punish people in prison? Give them oatmeal. What? Bread and water, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oatmeal, yeah. basically. Give them, oat, give them starch and water. That's, that's called punishment. And, we're, and there's people choosing to do it. And I'm just shocked. I'm really just shocked that people don't want to eat more fruit. I've never seen people turn down fruit. Nobody ever turns it down. When I offer them fruit, they go, oh, yeah, I'll have a piece of fruit. Everybody mm -hmm. loves fruit. It's our yeah. natural inclination to eat fruit. But we've been programmed. We've been seriously programmed to just avoid thinking about vitamin C, to avoid thinking about all those Maillard reactions. Let's not even yeah. – let's not – Look, I love starchy food. It doesn't love me back. So yeah. for me personally, I eat fruit rather than starch. And I find it funny, you know, because they're both considered carbohydrate source, but there's no hydration in starchy food. We've cooked all the hydration right out of it. What if what, you've and, cooked it out? But as you said, when you make your pasta or you make your beans or you make your or even mm -hmm. potatoes and water, there's some water in there, right? There's you, some, there's yeah. some. Which brings the calorie density down. So it's more like a fruit or a so vegetable. Let me, let me ask you a question. Yeah. It's a fun interview when I get to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. How much water do you drink on an average day? Not much. And I probably, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, 
but okay, let me ask you, <laughs> let me ask you this. So be, because you're, I know you're not a fan of fragmentation, right? You like the, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, right? Your, your fruits, your vegetables. Do you, are you a fan of drinking water? Because that seems like that's kind of fractionated as well. Or are you a fan of getting all your water from your, your food? I'm a fan of not eating things that cause me to be thirsty. Gotcha. And as a result of that, I get all my water needs met through my fruits and vegetables. Yeah. But if I go sunbathe in the tropics for two hours, or I'm swinging a sledgehammer for all day in summer yeah. heat, I definitely need to drink some water to make up for that exertion. Cause that's, that's water above and beyond what yeah. you would just need if you were, in the shade lounging you know hanging yeah. out in a tree like an orangutan might just lounging yeah. around if i'm gonna so if what, i'm gonna be sweating i'm gonna be drinking yep yeah. so what do you with your clients what do you tell them is the best way to transition are you a fan of people diving in this head first or slowly or quickly or depends partly, on your personality partly it depends on their personality type like you know, how would you go into a swimming pool? Would you dive in or would you go in through the shallow end? It's a good mm -hmm. question to ask people. Or how would you learn? How would you learn Spanish? If you wanted to learn Spanish, would you want one word a day for the next 10 years? Or do you just go get a Spanish girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, and, and yeah. immerse for three or four weeks? Uh, certainly the, the most success happens from total immersion. Most success, total immersion. So if I'm going to guide people, I'm going to go eat and cook foods like banging your head against the wall. How quickly do you want to stop? Most people want to stop right now, banging your head against the wall. What's the best way to quit smoking, drinking, injecting yeah. heroin? Um, you know, you're talking about a highly addictive habit that people will come up with endless justifications for continuing to eat cooked food. Cause they don't want to give it up. I didn't want to give it up either, man. I didn't want to give it up. I just got better results. Yeah. And I couldn't argue with better results. It would, if, 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 who was I going to argue? I'm arguing against myself. I'm getting better results on raw food than I was on cooked. I couldn't go back. And I still went back probably 20 times in 15 years until I finally go, this is stupid. Let me figure this out. And that's when 80, 10, 10 was born. Now, let's uh, let's talk for a second about fiber. Tell um, me, it's not the stupidest. It's not the stupidest book title ever, though. I mean, what's it tells that? you eighty ten ten. It tells oh. you nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not going to say that because uh, you know, I I think it's. Um, I think it creates some curiosity. Uh, it creates a mystery. It, it sure does. But so That's fiber, Doug, fiber, yeah. Doug, nine, nine, I think it's latest stats I've seen is 97% of Americans are deficient in fiber. You know, sure. the average American's getting like 16 and a half grams a, a day. It should be, I mean, I, I bet you on your diet, you're getting what, 80 to 120. I'm uh, getting so much fiber, but a big difference is that almost all of it is soluble fiber. That's the thing I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Because again, you talk in your book about how you love the soluble fiber that you know kind of gels up. You're not a fan of the insoluble fiber that's in. No, that's like ground glass, man. Ground glass yeah. is insoluble fiber, which blew my mind. And it's like, really? I mean, really? Because I was under the impression that, you know, Will Bolshewitz and Robin Shutkan, who I've had on the podcast, you know, sure. whole intact, whole intact grains, beans, great sources of, you know fiber resistant fiber you know build that healthy microbiome right that that most people are who you know, said that the, who said that the easiest way to get a man not to see a fact is to make his income reliant upon him not seeing that fact mm -hmm. i can't remember who said it maybe now light I'm is falling again <laughs> it's more like aldous huxley or something i don't know who said it but um I'll find out as soon as we're done here. Mm -hmm. But but that's what we're dealing with basically. There's there's 
I'm honored to be surrounded by some of the most brilliant men in the world in the field of vegan nutrition and and all the different aspects of it. I, I'm honored to be included. Even. And women. And women. And women. Yeah, I didn't mean I meant people. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really I, I and women and and in many cases more the women. But most of them have backed themselves into a corner because their income's dependent upon it. And now they can't see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there anybody going to argue fruits and vegetables are better for us than starch? Can you make that argument? If we had a, if we had a, if we had a platform, you know, and it was just you and me and we we're out there for blood and guts, you know, could you actually beat me that starches are better for us than fruits and vegetables? Well, I haven't, I, I haven't staked my whole life and reputation on, you know, um, starch based McDougal has, I know right? he, yeah. he, he cannot, we, yeah. he's lost. Have you ever been, have you ever been, uh, on uh, to John's, you know, um, advanced weekend study or anything like that or no. been on? No, no, no. Okay. But I do know that he used to come out in a strong, strong statement that no human being should ever buy any circumstance no human being should ever consume salt uh, because it's such a deadly poison and then he changed his view and he said well what's the point of promoting the world's healthiest diet if nobody will eat it because it has no taste right right <laughs> so right. eat a little salt you know and i'm going wait a minute i've got two different things in print here from this man on the same topic that are diametrically opposed and no, I haven't. I haven't been to his stuff. I've read his stuff. I've read a lot of him. I respect him highly. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. These guys, all of these guys, uh, the ones you know, and many, many more, the ones we all know. I mean, around the world, there's some fantastic people creating yeah. vegans. So yeah. my question to you is, if you need to go to the bathroom and you're at my house and you need to go to the bathroom or you want to yeah. know even better, you want to know where the bathroom is. So you ask me where the bathroom is and I say, well, what you do is first you start, start going to the health food store and buy health store versions of the things you normally buy and then get so interested in the whole thing that maybe you become, maybe you become a vegetarian. And then when you realize that that's not the answer, that you become a vegan. And then when you realize that's not the answer, you become a raw foodist. And then when you realize that's not the answer, you become a low-fat raw foodist like all of our anthropoid primate cousins are already doing. And, and you know, it's like, how do you get to Miami from Fort Lauderdale? Well, you go to Houston, and then you go to Seattle, and then you go to Portland, Maine, and then you drop down, and the next thing you know, you're, you're right there. Mm -hmm, or you mm -hmm. could just go next door, go from cooked to not cooked. It's it's the shortcut is the way to go. For me, I don't really care. I don't even need to know whether you need the bathroom, whether you're going to run, whether you're going to skip, whether you're going to hop, whether you're going to walk backwards, whether you're going to detour. But you don't want me to tell you the long cut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You want me to tell you, oh, it's the next room on the left. Just turn, you know, go out this door, turn left. It's right. It's there on your left. You want the short, the shortest route to the bathroom, the most direct route. So the most direct route is go from cooked to not cooked and, and find out if it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it challenging? Yes. But it's, I mean, anybody want to argue with me? Health is so much easier to live than sickness. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I will I will always take a healthy day over a sick day. So for me, health is so much easier than sickness. It's not whether cooked food is easier than raw food. It's mm -hmm. whether health is easier than sickness. And for me, I mean, yeah, you, your, never have, you never have to ask me when we meet, how are you? Yeah, yeah. Doug, is your whole family eat the way you do? Your wife? Actually, your actually, yes, they do. Yeah. Yes, they do. By choice, but yes, they do. Yeah. Well, they, they probably see the, the results with you and they uh, respect and admire you greatly. So there well, you I'm fortunate. My wife actually went raw food before I met her. Wow. Well, <laughs> more than 20 years ago, more than, yeah, I don't, I'm not allowed to say how many more. <laughs> got, got it. Um, 
Now, so aside from, you know, in your book, you talk about how aside from eating a low fat, raw plant, uh, plant-based diet, you're also a fan of kind of a, you know, holistic approach with what's going on with your life with fitness and Absolutely. some other things. Can you, can you talk about like that, the whole spectrum that you, that oh, you I used, I used a phrase earlier for the, when we were talking about the 4-H club, the substances, the forces, the influences, the conditions, the things that result in health. We, there's an old book called nature seven doctors where they talk about fresh, pure water and clean air and, and enough sleep and enough rest and, and positive mental attitude and, and eating enough fruits and vegetables and, and all these different and, and being physically active. Like all these are, are, were considered nature seven doctors, right? Well, in the science of, of human health, which is known as hygiene, uh, not just washing your hands, but the entire science of human health is referred to hy as hygiene. Yeah. We did, there are clear cut descriptions of the more than 30 different features of human life that are absolutely essential to our well being, which include look, I mean, we're talking about life and death stuff here, but it doesn't mean we can't be lighthearted about it and have a good time. Mm -hmm. You know, when we need to be serious, we can be very serious, but we also have to, we also have to be congenial and have some social time. We can't just be living in a cave all by ourselves all the time. That's not the healthiest way to go forward. Um, so, so all of these different aspects and food is just one of them. And we get bent out of shape about food. It's like never talk about politics, religion, or food. Because you're really stepping on people's toes. And, and I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm just saying fruits and vegetables work well for me. If you want to join me, the water's fine. If you don't, fine. But if you want to find out more, go to my website. I got the biggest FAQ on raw foods that exists. And, and you can go to my forum and it's free. And ask any question you want and, and stuff like that. So if you want to find out about it, great. But for people who don't, aren't interested... I mean, you can't, uh, one of my mentors said you can lead a horse to water, but you can't hold their head under till they get thirsty. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, Doug, I, I, let's talk for a second about protein. If we can. Yep. I think, I think we can. I think we've got enough time. Um, it's easy. So, so it's yep. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to read something that I, that I got from your book. And that is here. Let me find it here. Um, so when we talked about this a little earlier, but I want to repeat it again. You say, in truth, there's really no such thing as a high protein diet, which we talked about. And then on page 104, you say, there is a mountain of compelling research showing that low quality plant protein is the healthiest type. Mm -hmm. and, and, and T. Colin Campbell also talks about that, how a high bioavailable protein doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's, it, it's good for you. We, mm -hmm. and, and so can you like expound on that? Well, we start stressing the kidneys and we start stressing the liver when we eat higher content of protein than what we see. It's a funny world. Nutrition's a funny, a funny concept because in all other sciences and all the other health sciences, what, what we learn when we look at blood work, we go, oh, we don't want to be too high in magnesium. We don't want to be too low. We don't want to be too high in red blood cells. We don't want to be too low. We don't want to be too high in this or yeah. too low. Always we want to be what's called within normal limits. But in the world of nutrition, we, we somehow bought into the idea that more is better. Yeah. And that's not the case. Too much vitamin A and you die. Too much vitamin K and you die. Too much of many things and you die um even so water you know, yeah <laughs> i mean more is not better therefore the highest source of this that or the next thing is not automatically the best source mm -hmm. in fact it very often isn't the highest source of vitamin a is polar bear liver but if you want to go to the really highest source the highest source of vitamin a is a vitamin a supplement we think of supplements as being more nutritious than food because the word, their name is supplement. We think of it as a, ver as a verb, not a noun. 
And and that we get in trouble because of that. Because what if we change the name? What if we call them detriments? They're 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 the most isolated, pharmaceutically pure crystal white powder on the planet with a with no shelf life, right? Like an endless shelf life. It doesn't can't go bad. Doesn't that tell anything that can't go bad already is bad. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it could go bad. But so. So it's the most isolated thing. We we look at protein powder like it's a good thing, but we look at sugar like it's a bad thing. Right. So, so sugar is an isolated calorie source stripped of all its related or associated nutrients. But protein powder is an isolated calorie source stripped of all its associated just like, nutrients. Just like oils, right? Just like oils. oils the same again. They're empty calories. These are empty calories. So an interesting thing happens. My, my physiology teacher back in medical school was a lady named Mrs. Pettit. And, and I really liked Mrs. Pettit. And she knew a ton of stuff. And one day we were reviewing for the national boards in physiology. I'm, I'm about to sit the board, right? And so we took a special course and you just review physiology for hours. And she said something that I'd never, she might have said it before, but I never caught it. And she said, when you heat proteins, any protein, every protein, when you heat it, the bonds mm. separate and cross-link and rejoin. They're called cross-linked proteins. And cross-linked proteins are invariably two things. Number one, they're indigestible. Number two, they get recognized as foreign substances and can be carcinogenic. Mm. Uh, I went up to her afterwards, after class, I said, what do you mean cross-linked proteins are indigestible? She said, well, technically, that's not how we describe them. We describe them as enzyme-resistant. Cross-linked bonds are enzyme-resistant bonds, kind of like in the movie, you know, where the guy goes, bonds enzyme resistant bonds and <laughs> so i go enzyme resistant bonds what you mean she goes we do not manufacture the enzymes that will help us break down enzyme resistant bonds we don't have them we can't access those proteins mm -hmm. so all that protein that people are eating that's cooked protein they're not even accessing it hmm. so what they're does it do they're they poop it out. They're living on a low protein diet, just like everybody else. Hmm. And this yeah. is why the scientists tell us that if our protein intake goes below three percent, we could get in trouble. But above ten percent, we definitely are stressing our kidneys. Right. And what else? What else is going on when your protein content goes above ten percent? You you talk about uh, in the well, books this, like. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever see kids run around at a birthday party, right? When we when their sugar, blood sugar goes oh, absolutely. from absolutely. isolated nutrient. So when protein goes up, every alarm bell in the in the planet, every alarm bell on your body goes off, right? And says, We've got to lower this protein content. And it does that in a variety of ways, right? Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, respiratory rate goes up, uh, temperature goes up. As we start trying to process this protein faster to get it out of the bloodstream, because this is a, a medical emergency, white blood cell count goes from 3 million to 18 million. That's the equivalent of your temperature going from 100 to 600. That would be crazy if your temperature went up to 600, right? Parameters for most things don't change by more than 3 or 4%. And between unhealthy and healthy uh blood calcium goes from nine to eleven and that's a big range mm. but here we're talking about normal being three million and after every single meal of cooked food white blood cell count shooting up to 18 million because foreign proteins these indigestible enzyme resistant cross-linked bonds enter into the bloodstream create create every emergency possible we got to deal with that so you're now stressing your adrenals you you create a cascade of of problems as the body tries to fend off 
this stuff. So the white blood cells are the all American cells. You use them once and throw them away. Mm -hmm. They start collecting this protein as fast as possible. We get all this pus, mm -hmm. we get all this mucus creation. Uh, nothing good happens when you exceed your needs. Mm -hmm. Be like buying you a pair of size 27 shoes. And what about the, but what about, I mean, so I didn't answer what you were looking no, for. Well, well, <laughs> which is basically like the protein you're going to get from animal products um, is of, you know, it's too high in the sulfuric containing amino acids, supposedly, you know, promotes inflammation. It's, yep. it's very bioavailable, but what you're going to get from maybe your, your fruits and your veggies is more of a Goldilocks version. Well, uh, it is, it's bioavailable when it's raw. Mm -hmm. The raw meat, right? That's bioavailable protein, but mm -hmm. not once it's cooked. Now it's just, it's that cross link protein. It might as well be glued together. Okay. You know, when okay. you used, we talked about it earlier, the difference between paste and glue is paste is a plant based product and glue is an animal based yeah. product. So you're creating glue when you start cooking animal proteins. Right. Right. And so do you consider plant based proteins a low quality? Well, low and high is a funny, is a, again, a funny phrase, right? Because if you're a size seven shoe, size three is, is low. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you're a size three shoe, then three is perfect. Mm -hmm. So what the scientists have told us is that we need to get 3% to 10% of our calories from fat and three to 10 from protein. And anything beyond 10 is excess. But when, when nutrition studies have been done on, on diet and they've concluded that low-fat diets are a complete waste of time, they're looking at a standard Western diet, 45% of calories coming from fat, and then they do a low-fat diet and it's only 35% of calories. Right. Or I read one study that was down to 33, you know, and, and, and that's still triple to quadruple what I'm recommending and what the sports scientists are recommending and what the performance specialists are recommending and what the oncologists are recommending and what the cardiologists are recommending and what the, what the diabetes specialists are all recommending. If they know, if they're following the JAMA notes from 1959, if you've, if you've, I'm sure you've watched that video, how to become a diabetic in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, everybody's recommending what they call low fat diet, but it's not low, low in pie is a problem when you're low on petrol, you know, you're low on gas. Uh, uh Oh, the water in the, the water level has gone low. It's almost like we left out the word too. Right. It's right. Too low, right. It implies right. a problem. But in this case, we're just saying compared to the high fat diet, yeah, uh, the standard Western diet is so high in fat. Ours is actually within normal limits. Three to 10% is within normal limits. 15%, I don't care. You want to go up into the high teens. That's all within normal limits. But you exceed that and predictable health decline mm -hmm. is what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, your genetics will determine whether that's cancer, heart disease, diabetes, digestive disorders, you know, yeah. that's going to be through your genetics where your strengths and weaknesses lie, but that's what's coming. At what age do you think 80, 10, 10 is good for like starting age three, four, five, two? What do you think? I think the important thing there is when children wean, that they should wean onto fruit. Mm. That's the important thing. They should wean onto something else that's sweet and juicy. Um, and they should wean on in, in all other species, the, they wean onto whatever the parents eat. Yeah. But our parents, you know, weren't eating fruit and veg. So it was difficult. I've got, yeah, I've got a 13 year old, a, a 15 year old and an eight year old. And, you know, obviously they're a hundred percent plant-based plant strong. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I told my wife, I was interviewing you today and, you know, I was like really fascinated by your your book and all the information that's in there. And, and, uh, and she's like, well, I don't Thank know if we could, but I don't know if we could ever do this with it, with our kids. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll be sure to ask Doug. My that. daughter, my daughter weaned at eight years of age. Yeah. And she yeah. said, to, she said to Rosie, she said, mom, I'm done. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. So she and it was, yeah. and and she knew she was done, and yeah. it was hard on Rosie. Yeah. It wasn't hard on Francesca. She said, "I'm done, Mom. I'm done. I, I don't need to. I don't need to come to you anymore. I'm. I'm. I'm there." Yeah. And, and she never went back. Not once after that. Yeah. But you know, but until then, yeah. And we didn't ever try to force the process. We said it's always there. It's always available. Take your time. But she had her first food just after she turned one. Mm. She had her first fruit just after she turned one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Doug, I think it's easy to feed kids fruit. Yeah, I, I've never had a trouble getting kids to eat fruit. They love berries. They love. They yeah. want you to prepare it for them, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never found kids that wouldn't eat fruit. They love yeah. it. What about? But yeah, I think I think one of the things my wife was worried about is, well, don't they need more more fat than that? And you're saying no, that that's fine. All the fat you need is right there in the fruits and the vegetables. Three well, to three to ten percent. You certainly need a little more fat when you're little. Mother's milk is 50% fat. Yeah. And that's why the weaning process mm -hmm. could take seven or 10 years. I mean, it was okay. If it took seven years to go from 50% fat down to 15% fat, that's only a couple of percentage points a year. It's not mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And and they can get that from avocado and they can get that even from some seeds eventually and nuts eventually, but no rush on introducing those because they're linked with allergic hyperallergic responses if you give kids nuts and seeds too early. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly certainly all the fatty fruits are easy, yaki and mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, if they're actually weaning over those years, then they're getting the fats from mother's milk. Yeah. Listen, you know, I, I, I've heard you, I've heard about your book for literally a good 20, 20 years and I'm actually surprised it's taken me this long to kind of reach out to you and get you on the podcast and kind of get 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 a um, get to know you a little bit. But I am absolutely positive that this podcast is going to create a lot of questions and a lot of furor in in the community. And I know I know that this is not what you set out to do, but but so I, I would love to have you back on again. And we can kind of go down, continue to go down this rabbit hole a little bit if you're if you're game for it. So. I, I would love it. I don't mean to sound repetitive, and I don't mean to sound unrelenting. Yeah. But eat more fruit, man. The <laughs> the answer for everybody is eat more fruit. I'm not, you know, eat what you want, but eat more fruit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, this morning I had. In a big bowl, I had two bananas. I had a grapefruit. I had a sumo sumo orange. I had a kiwi, and uh, and I had a bunch of frozen berries. And I put all that in a bowl and ate it. And I was and I did it in honor of you. <laughs> Bless your heart. That's really yeah. fantastic. Yeah, going for the bullseye. All right, uh, Doctor Doug Graham, thanks for coming on the show. Um, it really, pleasure. you are. You're a trailblazer. You're enlightening. And thank you for getting out there and speaking your truth. Thank you, Rip. Go to health, my man. <laughs> hey, Doug, where can people go to, to find out more about you, websites, you social media? Link fine if we run out of time, but it's food yeah. and sport. It's the word food, the letter N, the word sport.com, 10 letters, food and sport.com. Go there. You get all the information you want. You can email me. You can ask questions, whatever you need. And, and I just tell everybody, I, I mean, I just tell everybody up your health mm -hmm. and rip. I tell you to up yours too, buddy. I mean, like, no, up your health. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But look, health is serious business, but it's the best feeling in the world. And nothing tastes better than feeling good feels. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I just love feeling good. Right on. Hey, fist bump. Absolutely. Plant strong. <laughs> 811. Dr. Doug Graham's book is The 80-10-10 Diet. And I'll be sure to link it up along with his other resources in the show notes for today. As Doug and every teacher has ever told us, eat more fruits and veggies. We've got to satisfy that sweet tooth 
after all. Have a great week, and as always, keep it plant strong. Thank you for listening to the Plant Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.